So, what's a conformal block and why should you care about it? Well, if you want to know what one is, then you can watch the lecture. And at the end, you'll have seen four ways to calculate them, uh, two uses of them. Uh, they are ubiquitous in conformal field theory. If you're doing anything to do with conformal field theory, you will at some stage need to know something about them. Uh, properties, results, numerical values, uh, they're used in ADS CFT, uh, come up in the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, uh, in percolation, uh, in the AGT correspondence, they're related to gauge theory and four dimensions. Uh, they're the building blocks of conformal field theory, and if you're going to do anything with them, you should know about them. Uh, I hope the talk, the, the talk is, is uh, followable. Uh, I don't do everything. It's impossible to do everything. Uh, I do some things badly. Uh, like everything I've ever done in terms of teaching, if I had the chance, I would just do it all over again, differently. Well, mostly differently, and of course that's not possible. So uh, I hope you'll put up with the bits that are, that are annoying and let me know, just in case I have the time to re-record any of it. If there's any interest, then hopefully you know, some feedback would be helpful. Uh, there are going to be exercises and references. Uh, I'm not sure if they're going to be ready exactly the time the video goes out, or maybe a day later. If you've got any questions, please email me. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, and I hope that you get to the end of the talk. Right, so we'll start with uh, properties of the conformal group. So a conformal transformation, change of coordinates x to x dashed, uh, is conformal if it changes your metric in the standard way only by a factor. Now you can think about that, or it's often much simpler to think about infinitesimal transformations, x goes to x plus alpha. And then the fact that the metric changes by an overall factor, uh, you can work out to be a differential uh, relation for alpha. So alpha has mu components. Uh, after a while, you can show that the, the block of its divergence is zero for d equals one. Then, uh, by taking various derivatives and recombining them in all sorts of ways, uh, you can show that this combination of d mu, d nu, d tau of, of alpha rho uh, is zero if d is not equal to one or two. That means it's at most quadratic. There's a linear term, uh, a quadratic term, uh, constant term is just a translation. That linear term is a rotation or a Lorentz transformation, a scale transformation, and a special conformal transformation. Uh, there'll be some exercises if you want to go through, seeing how to uh, work those out and how to exponentiate them. And you can count the number of components, uh, number of parameters. And you find it's a half d plus 1 d plus 2, corresponding to the Euclidean conformal group being SO1 d plus 1, and the Lorentzian conformal group SO2d. And just to point out that Euclidean and Poincaré transformations can be extended by scale transformations, and they can be extended by special conformal transformations. But just having scale transformations doesn't require special conformal transformations. That used to be uh, a mistake made in the past. I don't think people make that mistake anymore. Scale transformations are uh, are in mathematically independent from special conformal transformations. Now in d equals 2, uh, the only equation you get is the top equation, and in like cone coordinates it's very simply that d plus of alpha minus is d minus of alpha plus is 0. So they are arbitrary functions. Alpha minus an arbitrary function of x minus alpha plus an arbitrary function of x plus. Uh, and what that means is you can reparameterize. 
your light cones by arbitrary functions f and g. Uh, a conformal structure is entirely encoded in the pattern of, of light rays, uh, and they can just be moved around parallel to each other, uh, how you like, by uh, arbitrary functions f and g. It's a very intuitive way to see that there are two infinite dimensional uh, symmetries independent, reprioritizing left and right. In Euclidean space, if z is x plus i y, uh, then the equations are the cauchy riemann equations, saying that alpha of z bar is a function of z bar, and alpha z is a function of z. And so z can go to an arbitrary function of z, and z bar to an arbitrary function of z bar, with those are analytic functions. So again, two uh, infinite dimensional symmetries independent. Now, uh, before we go into more complicated transformations, look at scale transformations. x goes to lambda x. Now, if a field under scaling transformations just transforms with a, with a, with a homogeneous factor, we say it's a scaling field. Uh, and under infinitesimal transformation, where it's just a multiple of x, then the field is given by the following expression, the change in the field. So this is an example of a more general rule uh, given in terms of the Jacobian and delta divided by d. Delta is the scale dimension, d is the dimension we're in, uh, and a corresponding formula for the change. Uh, and it's worth saying that this transformation with the power of the Jacobian uh, is a particular transformation law for a scalar field. Uh, fields can have indices, uh, and then they would have more general transformation laws. Uh, we're not going to look at them here. You can find them elsewhere. Uh, we'll look at fields with spin in two dimensions, but in, in a higher than two dimensions, uh, it's enough just to think about scalar fields, what we're doing here. But of course, not all scalar fields will transform in that way. If you take a derivative of a field, uh, then it's, that will transform uh, differently because the Jacobian will be picked up its derivatives under the transformation law. So. Uh, Although this uh, is different, it's not the same law, uh, it is perfectly understandable. Uh, the field phi, block phi inherits its transformation law from phi, and, and it's said to be a descendant. Its transformation law is uh, completely indetermined by the transformation law for phi. Now in d equals 2, we can straight away think about uh, the transformation law where we look at the analog of the Jacobian. It has got two separate left and right or holomorphic and anti-holomorphic uh, functions and so a field we can consider the transformation law where it transforms uh, with a factor of the derivative uh, each with their own power h and h bar. And so certainly scale transformations are examples of this uh, and a field will transform homogeneously with a factor uh, lambda to the scale dimension delta, which is h plus h bar. Uh, and if we do a, a rotation, uh, w is e to the i theta z, corresponding to w bar, uh, the field will just pick up a phase, uh, e to the i theta h minus h bar. And this combination, h minus h bar, is called the spin. So this transformation law, uh, with the two separate derivatives. Uh, if a field obeys that, for a scale transformation, it's called a scaling field. There are a special set of globally defined coordinate transformations, uh, z goes to az plus b over cz plus d, that map the plane to the plane, including infinity. And if a field satisfies that law for all of those, it's called a quasi-primary field. If, for a more general transformation, a field obeys exactly the same law star for any wz and wz bar, it's called a primary field, and that's the most restrictive type of transformation law. So primary fields are special. They are examples of quasi-primary fields, which are themselves examples of scaling fields. So. Uh, 
these properties are enough to fix a two and three point function is just global conformal transformations. So a two point function is fixed. Uh, first of all, we can in, in any number of d dimensions by conformal transformation. By we translate one of the points to the origin. We can rotate so that the, the vector is along the one direction. Uh, we don't need to invert. All we need to do is to scale. Uh, we can rescale so that that field is at the position 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So the two-point function is entirely determined by the value of the two-point function evaluated at 1, 0, 0, 0 for one field and 0 for the other. And if we define uh, bra and ket or in and out states, uh, well, the limit as x goes to 0 defines as, uh, a ket. We need to put a weight in to define the bra state. Then the two-point function is equally given by the overlap of these two states and a universally defined factor for a scaling field. I've missed off the rotation term there. So these are scalar scaling fields. If it rotates, then of course there'll be a, a, an extra factor. So the three-point function of scalar fields is likewise determined. Uh, we can send uh, z to the origin x to infinity and y to 1 comma 0, uh, there will be a rotation involved, so this is only going to be for scalar scaling fields uh, in d dimensions, then the three-point function is entirely fixed, the functional form. There is a number, which is a value evaluated at these special values, uh, and a functional form is fixed. But the four-point function, the functional form is not fixed, as we'll see now. So what we can do, uh, we've got these four points, uh, we can send one of them, let's call it x1, we can map to infinity, x4 to zero, uh, we can scale and rotate uh, so that x2 is at distance one along the one direction, uh, and we can furthermore rotate x3 so it's in the 1, 2 plane. So x3 is given by coordinates x, comma, y, comma, 0, comma, 0, comma, 0. Uh, but that's the best we can do. We've got no more symmetry left, and we have the result that the four-point function of scalar quasi-primary fields is given up to a prefactor by the value of the function of the four-point function evaluate at these special values, infinity, one, x, y, and zero. So there is a two-parameter family of functions. The functional form is not fixed. So that's where conformal blocks come in, or conformal partial waves. We can insert a complete set of states, uh, orthonormal states, uh, in a representation of the conformal group. And so we if we sum over all representations of the conformal group, uh, then we will be able, we will get the whole function back again. So if rho is a representation, then that four-point function is the sum over representations of insertions where we sum over the states in that representation to give a projector onto that representation. And then what we get is two numbers for those three-point functions times a function, which is called a conformal partial wave or a conformal block. So the word conformal block in, in d greater than 3 is well defined. In d equals 2, it can mean uh, several different things depending on context. So here, these are conformal blocks for the global conformal group. And you can choose to do it in a different way. You can choose to, to do it over a different channel. You can, instead of, put, instead of separating between two and three, you can move the fields around and do it between uh, uh, two, three, and one, four. And so you get equations relating uh, the expression of your four-point function as the sum over conformal partial waves. Uh, these are called crossing relations, and they are very powerful. They are what's used to find the solutions to two-dimensional conformal field theories uh, without an action or a Lagrangian, 
that's the property that fixes it. And they give very strong constraints uh, on d equals 3 or d equals 4 theories uh, when used in the new conformal bootstrap. But those are the two things we're going to find right at the end of this uh, lecture. So we will just now move on to specialization to d equals 2. So in two dimensions, uh, there's a finite dimensional global conformal group, uh, the analog of uh, what there is in a dimension, which is SO31, which if you recall, is roughly the same as SL2 plus SL2. There are two independent copies of SL2. So we can work out how this works by thinking about special conformal transformations in complex coordinates. There are translations. d by dx is d plus d bar. d by dy is i into d minus d bar. Uh, Rotations are again given in terms of combination of this time of uh, Zd minus Z bar D bar. And their counterpart is scale transformation, which is Zd plus Z bar D bar. And the special conformal transformations, as you can work out, are given in terms of combinations of Z squared D and Z bar squared D bar. So we see there are two commuting sets of differential operators uh, that implement special conformal transformations, d, zd, z squared d, one copy of SL2, and d bar, z bar d bar, z bar squared d bar, a second copy of SL2. So we choose the names uh, L minus 1 to correspond to the translation operator d, L0 to the scale operator, and L1 the special conformal operator. And these have commutation relations. L1 with L minus 1 is 2L0. L0 with L1 is minus L1. And L0 with minus 1 is plus L minus 1. We work out transformations of fields. Uh, well, infinitesimal transformations, Z goes to Z plus alpha Z. Alpha as a function of Z. Then the change in the field is given by H, which are thinking about the Z transformation, H D alpha phi plus alpha D phi. So for a translation, we get delta phi is A D phi, corresponding to the generator L minus 1, differentiates with respect to D. It's a translation operator. For a scale transformation, we find that L0 commuted with phi to generate this transformation is h phi plus z d phi. And for a special conformal transformation, where the, <coughs> the variation is quadratic, we find the commutation relation of L1 with phi that generates this transformation is 2h z phi plus z squared d phi, which we can summarize neatly as Lm commuted with phi is z to the m plus 1 d phi plus h m plus 1 z to the m phi. Now, if phi is quasi-primary, meaning it satisfies those relations for uh, L0, L1, and L minus 1, then you can think about the, the state, the ket formed by taking the limit of the field phi to the origin. Then it satisfies L1 acting on phi is 0, and L0 of phi acting on phi is h phi. So that's the properties of a quasi-primary state. That's the definition of a highest weight state for the SL2 algebra. Uh, the space of states in this representation is spanned by actions of L minus 1 to the n on phi. If we use conjugation, uh, Lm dagger is L minus m, then we can write the projector onto this representation of the SL2 algebra. That's what we're going to need for the conformal partial wave or the conformal block for this global transformation. And it's given by uh, a ket, a bra, and an inner product. Now, we can work out that inner product recursively. Uh, we can act with L1 on L minus 1 to the n. Uh, that's one of the exercises. Very straightforward, it's just like your standard SU2 relations, uh, except with a minus sign in the way. And we find out this inner product is n factorial 
times a series 2h plus n minus 1, 2h plus n minus 2 down to 2h. Now that is a, a rising Poch hammer symbol. People disagree about the notation, but this is standard in uh, applied mathematics and theoretical physics, is to call that uh, 2h with brown brackets subscript n. Other people can mean different things by that, but uh, <clears throat> that's what it means here. So the next ingredient we need for the conformal partial wave or the conformal block are the three-point functions. And there's a neat trick to make these straightforward to work out, which is to consider the combination L minus 1 minus L0. So we can take its commutator with a quasi-primary field. We know uh, what that is because we worked it out earlier. And this difference is 1 minus Z derivative of phi minus H phi. What this means is that the commutator with a field inserted at 1 is just minus h phi. Sorry, that should be 1 there. It says z. Also, we can work out uh, that the, the bra states satisfy are annihilated by L1 and are eigenstates of L0. Uh, the next thing we need is to write L minus 1 in terms of L minus 1 minus L0. So we just add L0. And then we know the eigenvalue of L0 on L minus 1 to the m on phi h is just m plus h. That's easy to work out. And so we know the three-point function of L minus 1 to the n on phi h in terms of L minus 1 to the, L to the n minus 1. There's a factor of multiplying it. That factor is h plus n minus 1 plus h2 minus h1. And we can iterate that. The next factor is h plus n minus 2 plus h2 minus h1. And so when we got rid of all of the l minus 1s to the n's, we end up with another Pochhammer symbol. That product of n factors, each differing by 1, is another rising Pochhammer symbol. It's h plus h2 minus h1 subscript n. Multiplying that constant. Likewise, uh, the last ingredient we need for the uh, formal partial wave or the, car or the formal block, uh, phi n l1 to the n, phi 3 of z, phi 4. There's a Pochhammer symbol, a scale, z to the n, uh, a three-point function, and that three-point function is itself fixed, as we saw, by conformal transformations to be z to the h minus h3 plus h4 times a constant. So we can now put these ingredients together in our uh, conformal block expression. There's uh, the ket, the bra, the inner product on the bottom. And we know those three, but three point function. We know the denominator and we know the other three point function. The first three point function is a poch hammer symbol times a constant. The, de the denominator is a n factorial times a Pochhammer symbol. Uh, the three-point function is a monomial times a Pochhammer symbol times a constant. So the whole thing is a constant times a prefactor times a power series, where the power series is z to the n over n factorial times a Pochhammer times a Pochhammer over a Pochhammer. And if you've taken a course on special functions, uh, you'll recognize that as the power series expansion of something called the hypergeometric function, or 2f1. 2 and 1 can be left out uh, if you know what you're doing, but 2f1 makes it clear this is the uh, hypergeometric function uh, with two Pochhams on the top and one on the bottom. It's a problem is that people don't agree whether the conformal block has the whole prefactor, part of the prefactor, or no prefactor. So if you're going to look at a formula in a paper or a book, you have to check what their conventions are. Uh, I don't think I've even kept the same conventions in the papers I've written. Uh, you just have to make sure you state what you mean uh, when you start. So just to note that the hypergeometric function 
uh, with this power series expansion satisfies a, a rather nice differential equation, a second order differential equation. Uh, in some ways, this is the definition of that function. It's the function that satisfies that with particular properties, but that differential equation has a second solution uh, where the arguments are shifted around a bit and there's a different prefactor. So now we have a full result. We have only looked only at the z-dependence. So if we want to look at the z and z-bar dependence, we have to sum over intermediate states and in representations labeled by h and h-bar. Uh, those will correspond to physical fields. So C12 HH bar and C34 HH bar there. Uh, coupling constants uh, relating physical fields. So they're labeled by three physical fields. And this HH bar conformal block is the product of a Z and a Z bar block. So again, there's no standard notation whether your conformal block refers to the whole thing or just the factorized thing. And remember here, we're just talking about the global conformal group. The same names and the same arguments uh, work exactly uh, for the infinite dimensional conformal group, as we will see very shortly. So crossing symmetry uh, relates an expansion uh, over an in, uh, internal channel bet between two and three or moving it around. And one way to think about this is to do is it involves a rotation. You have to swap two fields around. You can't go through the middle one. So there's a rotation. So you have to find a, a, a continuous map that implements z goes to 1 minus z, naught goes to 1, 1 goes to naught, naught goes to infinity. And that means in the crossing relation, because of the rotations, uh, there will be a phase. Now, this phase is forgotten by some authors, uh, but it's important. And if you, if you forget it, then some of your formulae can be wrong. So I'll put a reference to uh, a work with, a, with that phase worked out properly. And one thing that's known about the hybrid geometric function is exactly its crossing properties. Under z goes to 1 minus z. Uh, because it satisfies uh, a related differential equation, it satisfies a different hypergeometric equation, it can be expressed in terms of solutions to that hypergeometric differential equation and its second solution. So that means <coughs> this rather nice property that uh, this function it can be completely expressed uh, in, in terms of, this, of, of a related function at 1 minus z. And likewise, you can also relate it to the function at z over z minus 1, 1 over 1 minus z, and 1 over z. Uh, and these are in all the standard textbooks on special functions. Uh, I use Gradstein and Rizik. Abramovich and Stegen will also have it. So just a note. Uh, I haven't, may not have spotted it, uh, but it's a, if you think about it, it's a little obvious that looking even at the, the uh, second term in the series expansion of this conformal block, there's a 2h on the bottom. Uh, so if h is 0, how does that make sense? It's going to diverge. But the two point, but, but that can't happen. Uh, it's, it's only consistent if phi1 and phi2 uh, have a non-zero two-point function, which works out that h1 has to be equal to h2. So if h1 is equal to h2, and you do that first of all, before sending h to 0, the block looks different. That has a, a rather special form. So the thing is, you can see that these fun this, this thing is not analytic. It, it depends very strongly on how you change uh, the h, h1 and h2. If you send h to 0 before you send h1 to h2, you get a divergence. If you send 1 to h2, before you send h to 0, you get the right answer. If you send them together, h1 goes to h2 at the same rate, or a related rate to the way h goes to 0, you can get any answer you want. So it's really important. The analytic properties of these functions are not nice, and they can cause headaches 
if you don't treat the functions carefully. So uh, <clears throat> that's enough for special conformal transformations. We've worked out the form of the, the uh, conformal clock. It's a hypergeometric function. And now it's time to go on to the extension from the special conformal transformations to the full conformal group and the Virasoro algebra symmetry that is in two-dimensional CFT. And that's in the next section. So now in D equals two, global transformations, which uh, map the Riemann sphere to itself or the complex plane plus infinity to itself, extend to analytic functions which don't do that. So you might think z goes to z squared. Well, that maps the plane to itself twice, for example. But still, we can still think about them. They still make perfect sense in, 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 as, as transformations on regions of the complex plane. And the formulae for the change in a field doesn't change. Uh, our generator is Lm. If the infinitesimal transformation is Zm plus 1, its commutation relation has exactly the same form uh, as L0, L1, and L minus 1. What changes is the commutator of Lm with Ln. Uh, there's now a central term. It's allowed to be there, and it has to be there. And we've now got the Virasoro algebra. So as before, uh, if we take the limit of a field on the origin, we get a state. Uh, it's annihilated by Lm. It's an eigenvalue of L0. And that's the definition of a highest weight state of a representation, which is determined by H and C. And it's spanned now, not just by L minus 1, but by uh, combinations of all these generators L minus P, so L with negative indices acting on the state H. L0 with Lm is minus MLM. That means that these uh, spanning states are eigenstates of L0. They are H plus a number, and that number we call the level of the state. Uh, it's a very convenient way to think about states as their level. It's the amount of excitation state they have. And we can list them. So at level 0, there's 1. Level 1, there's L minus 1. At level 2, there are 2. At level 3, there are 3. Uh, but it grows fast, because what you can see, if you think about it, is at uh, level n, there are as many ways as you can split the number n into different integers. So there are the partitions of n different states at level n. The field state correspondence, uh, which says that <coughs> phi corresponds to a field phi of z, uh, carries on. So L minus 1 phi being the derivative of phi says that L minus 1 acting on the state phi corresponds to the field d phi. L minus 1 to the n on phi corresponds to d to the n phi. Uh, for higher modes, you, more, you have to think know that uh, Lms are the modes of T of Z related to the holomorphic part of the angiomentum tensor or the stress tensor. And so field state correspondence relates, for example, L minus 2 on the state phi to a particular definition of normal ordered product of T with phi. And that's true for all modes. There are ways to express them as normal order products. In the case of h equals 0, then 0 is the vacuum state. L minus 1 on 0 is 0. L minus 2 on 0 corresponds to the field T of z. And 0, the vacuum state, corresponds to the identity operator. Now, Vera Zorro, I call them chiral blocks, conformal blocks. Uh, are defined exactly the same way as SU11 or SL2 blocks by inserting a projector onto a representation. A representation of the Virasoro algebra, in this case, labelled by H and C. And I've chosen them in these, this lecture to be normalised so that there is a particular prefactor out the front, then a number 1, and then a power series in Z. Again, some people have different factors or no factor. Uh, the crossing relation, uh, if the uh, 
can be expressed uh, in terms of a so-called fusing matrix times a uh, crossed four-point function, which is just shorthand for the functional form. Write it in the standard in, in the way that we've seen before. Uh, just make sure you get the labels in the right place. And that if there's a discrete sum, that FPQ is the fusing matrix, but it could be an integral, for example. Some theories have a continuous set of fields, uh, like Liouville theory, so it could be an integral. We need an example, uh, and the free fermion is the example that uh, I think is, is really easiest to work with. The two-point function uh, of a massless free fermion is, is just 1 over z minus w, and so using Wick's theorem, uh, the four-point function is really easy to work out. Uh, you can see that eight, uh, this field psi has scaling dimension 0, uh, has h equals 0, h bar, h equals a half, h bar equals 0, and so this special special way of moving a 1 to infinity, 1 to 1, 1 to z, and 1 to 0 uh, gives a rather nice function 1 over 1 minus z plus 1 over z minus 1. Uh, and in a series expansion, that is a particularly simple form, 1 over z plus z plus z squared plus z cubed. And it's an exercise to work that out uh, from the fermion mode algebra. So there's a unique expression in terms of global or SL2 blocks. Uh, remember what those were. We worked them out in the previous section, just given by hi simple hypergeometric functions. So you can work them out uh, <coughs> for h primed equals 2, h primed equals 4, and the special case of h prime equals zero. Remember the form uh, of the this, this series expansion has those rising Pochham symbols, which are just products of terms increasing by one each time. We're not forgetting the factorial on the bottom. So when h prime is two, <coughs> uh, or four, they're easy to work out. Uh, don't forget the very special case uh, when h primed is zero, then that global block is just monomial z to the minus two h. Then the fermion four point function, one over one minus z plus one over z minus one, you can work out <coughs> in terms of global blocks is, well, it's one, times h prime equals 0, plus 1 times h prime equals 2, which is promising so far, uh, but that doesn't stay like that, is plus a tenth times h prime equals 4, and plus 1 over 1, 2, 6 times h prime equals 6. So we'll see later how to find out what those coefficients are. Now the free fermion is naturally a CFT with C equals a half. The stress energy tends to take the form of a half, psi dash psi, normal ordered. Uh, those are the modes of psi. It's easy to work out the four-point function using those modes and their anti-commutation relations. Uh, the only allowed values of H in this theory, through representation theory of the Verisor algebra, are naught, a half, and a sixteenth. What that means is that the four-point function is itself, on its own, a single Virasoro conformal block at C equals a half. This is by itself crossing symmetric and that fusing matrix is one. But I say this is only at C equals one. Uh, a free fermion can live in lots of different theories. It could live in a theory of two fermions. It could live in a theory of three fermions. You live in a theory of a fermion, tense of anything else, so it has to have uh, be expressible uh, in terms of blocks at other values of c. And it's possible to work these out. Uh, takes a, a little time. Use uh, something to generate these functions and just do the subtractions. So it starts off with the block at 0, then a block at 2, but with the prefactor c minus half over c. And then 
well, a bigger prefactor times a block of four. Uh, Tenth c minus a half c plus 39 over 10 over c plus 22 over 5 c plus 44 over 5. That one tenth uh, is no surprise, it's related to the tenth we saw before. Uh, at c equals a half, there's only one term. Uh, and you can see there's a c equals minus a half in all the other terms. But there are going to be. Uh, <coughs> Places other values of c that are special. So minus 39 over 10, you can see that term with 4 vanishes. At c equals 0, there's a divergence. At c equals minus 22 over 5, there's a divergence. At c equals minus 44 over 5, there's a divergence. These are all special values of t. They can all be written in the form 13 minus 6t minus 6 over t for t rational. It's one of the key ways of expressing the central charge in terms of a parameter. Uh, it also occurs in Liouville theory. Uh, it occurs all over the place. This is one of the parameterizations that is, is uh, the way the theory is organized. And you can check. Uh, a half is c of 3 quarters. Minus 39 over tenths. 10 is c 5 over 12. Minus 22 over 5 is c of 2 fifths. Uh, and so on. And these factors uh, in the denominator tell you that there are null states, uh, states that decouple from the theory at those values. Uh, they're causing problems, but if the theory, but maybe not if your if your functions are well defined. The factor in the numerator tells us it tells us a truncation of the spectrum. So those numerator factors of c minus a half tell you that. At c equals a half, none of those other terms contribute. None of those none of those other fields are in the spectrum. All right. So the next four sections cover four methods of calculating the Virasoro conformal blocks. Five just looks at the brute force definition. Six uses null states to give differential equations. Seven uses recursion relations from analytic considerations, and eight is an exact formula from the AGT correspondence. To be fair, uh, 7 also gives exact formulae, uh, summing over partitions. Uh, this is a, a kind of exact formula, but somehow it feels less exact than the AGT formula, which is straightforwardly a series expansion uh, and tells you the coefficients in the series expansion. The recursion formulae don't quite do that. Uh, anyway, those are four methods. They're are other methods that I'm not going to mention. Uh, these are useful for exact calculations, they're useful for understanding theories, they're useful for numerical work. Uh, and okay, let's get on and do the next section, uh, the brute force definition. So uh, this section uh, I've called the brute force method, although really it's just using the definition of a conformal block in terms of a projector. Uh, but it's a brute force because it's really very ugly, it works, it always works, uh, but it's a lot of hard work for you or for your computer. So normally you would have a north normal basis uh, in your projector to project onto the representation H, but it's not easy to write one. Uh, instead, uh, use a set of states. The best you can do is restrict the states at a particular level. Let's call them i n, and then you can sum over levels and sum over states i and n, uh, bring them together with the inverse of their inner product matrix. So that tells you the coefficient uh, in the series expansion is a sum over states of three-point functions times an inverse of a matrix. So just uh, to remind ourselves, uh, well, a basis, I mean, the states you can write down, a priori independent, level by level at zero, uh, is just the highest weight state h. At one, there's just l minus one h. And the first case when there's more than one is at level two, where there's l minus two and l minus one squared. So what we need is the matrix of inner products yeah. and the three-point function. Right. 
So uh, let's do the inner products first. Uh, there's fewer fields involved. So they're entirely straightforward. Uh, you use the Virasora algebra. You use the fact that H is the highest weight state. Uh, and so it's, it, the other, the, it's the, if the ket is the highest weight state, then the bra satisfies relations L, uh, M, with N, L, N satisfy the Virasoro algebra. And so we can work out at level zero, we will define that to be one. At level one, we have L1, L minus one. Their commutator is 2H, so that gives 2H, L minus level two. Again, we've worked out the norm of this state. That's 2 times 2H and 2H plus 1. And the first one we haven't done is L2 with L minus 2. Again, there's a commutator. There's a term that vanishes because L2 annihilates the highest weight. And that is C over 2 plus 4H. And then there's the mixed term you can work out easily as 6H. So this inner product matrix is a 2 by 2 matrix uh, with simple entries. And so its inverse is 1 over the determinant uh, times a correspondingly simple matrix, just using the standard way to find the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. And the determinant is a polynomial in H and C. It's a cubic in H and a linear in C. But there are clearly going to be problems when the determinant is 0, because then uh, our expression, which involves determinant f of m in the in the, in, the, in the denominator is going to diverge. So the determinant is, is the famous Katz determinant, and it is known precisely. Uh, there's an a n factor constant that's known exactly, and then there's a product uh, over factors which are written in terms of h. h is equal to a special set of values hrs with uh, multiplicity given in terms of the number of partitions. And HRS is defined implicitly by writing C in a particular form in terms of T and HRS, again, in terms of that T. So in this case, uh, M2, the determinant of our 2 by 2 matrix is going to be from the formula, uh, just, well, RS equals 1 just is H11, and RS equals 2 allows us to have H12 and H21. And although there's a T in that formula, by the time you have uh, expanded it all out, t has vanished and you've got just a function of h and c. <coughs> Three-point functions we calculate as in the uh, SL2 global conformal case using commutation relations which are just the same for a primary field. And so the combination Lm minus L0 uh, is, is just a, a diagonal when you commute it with the field h. And so it's quite straightforward to do uh, to work out, for example, a three-point function with L minus one squared. It's got two factors, and with L minus two, it's got one factor. Okay, not very hard. With the result uh, that the general uh, conformal block with all four external values of H the same uh, can be worked out order by order. So uh, there's the pre-factor, the leading coefficient is 1, that's our normalization. Uh, there's the straightforward pair of factors uh, for the linear term. And the quadratic term is rather complicated. Uh, this vector uh, dotted into a matrix, dotted into a vector, divided by a determinant. So it looks you know, really quite ugly when written this way. We'll see later on. There, there are nicer ways to write it. It does have some nice properties, but like that it looks rather ugly. So uh, I thought it would be good to look at just look at the lines of vanishing H and C. So when the determinant vanishes in the HC plane. So this is uh, H along the x-axis, C along the y-axis. And we'll start by showing what happens uh, where M1, determinant of M1 vanishes. That's H equals zero. So that's just a vertical line. Uh, the, the next line is that's when uh, M2 vanishes. That's the two. That's M3 coming in now. Uh, you can see those uh, are smooth lines. That you can't see the H13 and H31 separately. Uh, now, as you increase the, the, the level of the determinant, uh, there are more and more lines. 
and that's really very high up and you can see that the bottom right hand bottom right hand corner is really looking very dense now in fact it will look dense here's a this is a close up of the range between c equals 0 and c equals 1 and there's lots of multiple intersections it will get denser uh, but those multiple intersections tell you something. Those red lines uh, are the unitary models. And the, the first one on the way up is the easing model. The next one is the theoretical easing model. Uh, in fact, all those multiple intersections are, are special models of some ways, but the red ones are the unitary ones. This is a, a broader view of the bottom uh, right-hand corner, now going for C negative. Uh, and that line on on the left is C is the C effective, which is C minus twenty four H equals zero. Those red lines uh, are classical have a, have a classical limit C goes to infinity. And here's the very boring uh, C positive. You can see there's nothing going on at all for H positive and C positive for C greater than one. Uh, and that's where Liouville theory, which we'll come across later, lives. So from the cast determinant, nothing very much is going on. Okay, it's time to go back to uh, conformal blocks, just to say that in the vacuum sector, because L minus one is zero straight away, uh, it's better to work with the smaller head of states. You don't want to have to worry about L minus one of zero, you just don't include it. Uh, and if you go through the same procedures, you can find in the vacuum sector here, I've said uh, H1 and H2 to be different. Uh, they, Z, there's no z term because l minus 1 vanishes. Uh, there's a z squared term and a z cubed term and a z to the fourth term. And the z to the fourth term has a, a denominator that has a pole at c equals minus 22 or 5. Uh, that's when h14 is 0. So it's good to have, I think, some, some useful examples. We're going to come across. Uh, with, other methods, we want to be able to check them later. Uh, C equals a half is the first one. This includes the free fermion and the easing model. Uh, so the allowed, in quotes, H values are the ones for which the Virasoro representations are unitary. And there's only three of them, 0, 16, and a half. And th that's how they're laid out in the CATS table in terms of H, R, S. So, there are three interesting conformal blocks. Uh, there's the half, 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 which is the free fermion uh, correlation function. There's uh, one with all, sixteenths on all four external legs, and you either have naught or a half in the middle. And those are moderately complicated. There's a prefactor to take care of some singularities, and inside uh, is just square roots. Uh, I mention it here because it may come up in the, in the exercises, uh, the Li-Yang model, C equals minus 22 over 5. We saw that corresponded to the pole uh, and the fourth coefficient of the vacuum conformal block. And these are given in terms of hypergeometric functions. Uh, you know the uh, properties of hypergeometric functions. Uh, we've mentioned uh, the crossing symmetry properties already. Anyway, it's useful to, to have some correlation functions to know if you're going to look at methods to conform blocks. If you're going to look at methods to construct them, it's good to know that you're, uh, you've got it right. Uh, and here's one at c equals one. Uh, and if h is irrational, uh, this free boson vertex operator correlation function is a conform block. Uh, so now we'll move on to a method where we can actually uh, use to find these solutions, which is using differential equations. So this section is on constructing uh, conformal blocks using differential equations. Differential equations come from null vectors, also known as singular vectors. So. We've seen in the previous section the CAC's determinant, and when that's zero, there are null states, uh, which are orthogonal to all states. And so, sorry, and so uh, they should decouple from correlation functions. So if a psi is a null state, uh, it has a zero norm, it's orthogonal to every other state, uh, then in particular in a correlation function. Uh, it should 
decouple and should give zero. So in the very simple, the very simplest case, uh, which is when the determinant uh, at level one, which is just h is zero, that corresponds to the null state l minus one on the vacuum. And if you put that l minus one on the vacuum in a correlation function and set it equal to zero, that gives you translation invariance. So that makes perfect sense. So after m one, uh, the next case is the cat's determinant at level two, which is a number times h minus h11, h minus h12, h minus h21. But those two factors are really just one case because they're related by t going to 1 over t. So let's take it to be h21, which in my conventions is 3 over 4t minus a half. So the state is at level 2, so it has to be a linear combination of l minus 2 and l minus 1 squared on uh, highest weight state h. And if it's orthogonal to all states, that means that L1 on that state should be zero, which is makes it quasi-primary. And in addition, L2 should be zero. So it should be primary or a highest weight state. Sorry, that's not because it's null. That's because this is the first time this appears in the cat's determinant. And we can check uh, L1. Well, you can always solve that. And that says always a quasi-primary at level two. The L2 condition also solve that, and the compatibility is that the determinant vanishes. And if you work it out, you find alpha is minus t, so a very simple expression. The null state is L minus 2 minus t, L minus 1 squared on h. So, uh, now general expressions uh, for uh, correlation functions of arbitrary h1, h2, and h3 uh, in which this state appears are known, uh, you can find them in the literature, but they're rather cumbersome. Uh, whereas if we take h1, h2, and h3 all equal and just call them h, which is h21 itself, so all the four fields have the same value of h, uh, then it's simple enough to present here how it works. So what we want is that that should be zero when psi is the descendant l minus two minus t l minus one squared. And I just like using the same method which is to subtract L0, add L0. Uh, that means that this combination can be commuted easily through phi h of 1 and phi h of z. Uh, let's get it right. So subtracting L0 means adding h in again. Doing all of that gives you a relatively straightforward differential operator acting on the function f, uh, so I should label f is going to be our four-point function. And the L minus one squared term is uh, now a product of two equally rather simple differential operators acting on f. So that's what f is. Now, with a certain amount of, of, of hindsight or foresight, uh, we can pull out some uh, singular dependence uh, and call the fun function g, and then G satisfies a, a rather nice differential equation, uh, which is in fact the hypergeometric equation, again, uh, but with the values a, b, and c best expressed in terms of t. So a is 2 minus 3t, b is 1 minus t, and c is 2 minus 2t. And uh, you know the solutions to, to this differential equation because we've discussed them before. Uh, now, Actually, it doesn't help necessarily to know the hypergeometric function as an expression because uh, sometimes uh, the functions are, are much more straightforward. I mean, Mathematica will tell you it's a Legendre P and a Legendre Q function, for example, which it thinks are simpler than hypergeometric. But in the case of t equals 4 thirds, c equals a half, and h equals 1 sixteenth, the functions are really quite simple elementary functions so there's that power out the front and then it's just in terms of a uh, square root inside a square root uh, there's a factor of two and a factor of a half just to get the leading power correct and we'll use this in uh, section nine to uh, solve the easing model because these are the conformal blocks for the easing model uh, spin field if we instead look at h equals a half for the same value of t which is c equals a half the second order differential equation has two solutions, one of which is the fermion function, four-point function, and the other one is some 
rather ugly looking hyperdramatic function and this is a spurious solution. It has no role in the easing model. And one way to see you get rid of it is to note that uh, H21 at this value of t is equal to H13. So that's at level 3 and there's an independent singular vector with an independent third order differential equation which eliminates the spurious solution. Uh, so of the two solutions to the second order equation, only one of them is a solution to this third order equation and it kills it off. And that's one of the ways in which uh, these uh, singular vectors uh, act uh, in interplay. So here's a mathematical worksheet uh, that I've written that works out, uh, well, it works out highest weight states, uh, finds uh, singular vectors, uh, finds differential equations, and uh, mathematics can solve. Just to show uh, that you can, you can use these methods uh, perfectly happily, uh, even if the algebra is rather too hard to do by hand. So in this case, the answer it gives uh, for uh, easy model is, well, the first one is, is the one we know and like, and you can check it's true. And the second one is the spurious Legendre function. Here's the spin field. Uh, it will find, find NV is find a null vector at level two. It's done it, those are the coefficients. Uh, N solve finds the differential equation from that null vector. Mathematica solves it. One of the equation solutions looks like the one we want, the other one doesn't at all, it's Legendre cube, but you can check that the solutions that I wrote down are solutions of the differential equation. The generic level two case uh, is rather horrible if you write everything in terms of H1, H2, and H3. Uh, but if you write them in terms, if you write H1 as uh, in terms of, of an auxiliary parameter alpha as H1 alpha, as though we're in the cat's table, h2 is h1 beta and h3 is h1 gamma. The equation, uh, well, it sort of symbolizes it's better than it was before, but the solutions come out really very straightforwardly in terms of nice combinations of, of the uh, alpha, beta, and gamma. And this is a sign that this really is the parameterization to use uh, to, if you want to understand uh, properties of these correlation functions. So, uh, looking at level three, there's a reason why we didn't do level three and only level two. Uh, there's H13. Uh, Mathematica can find uh, a singular vector. Not, there's not one at level two, but there is one at level three. Those are the coefficients. Uh, the differential equation is correspondingly a third order differential equation. And if we try to solve it, uh, well, it can't. This does not have a nice expression in terms of uh, elementary functions. It does have an expression in terms of integrals. Uh, so repeated integrals. Now, whether that's a useful analytic, th a useful numerical thing, uh, I don't know, but it's certainly very useful analytically for finding the crossing uh, behavior. So there are ways to do crossing behavior for, for, by, by recursion methods. But you can also do it by looking at rather complicated integral expressions. But as I said, in this case, you can check this third order equation uh, is satisfied by the free fermion uh, four point function as it should be. I should say that the differential equations are also uh, quite handy numerically, that it's very straightforward to solve a differential equation by a series expansion. So if you are interested in a numerical value of a, of a conformal block or a correlation function, uh, and you know it's got a differential equation, that is a very good way to find uh, its numerical values, as sometimes is needed, for example. People compare with numerical experiments or even real experiments, you want a numerical value for a function, then that's a, a perfectly good way to do it. So uh, the next topic is uh, some recursion relations. Uh, I say recursion relations, you can write down a formal expression which sums them up. So it's also an exact expression for various oracle formal blocks, uh, although they're presented as recursion relations uh, initially. So the idea, uh, we know the behavior of a conformal block in some limit, uh, but it will not be correct because it's just a limit. It will have corrections, and we want to write it as a sum over these corrections. 
Alternatively, uh, you can see it uh, comes from analysing the poles in the expression for the conformal blocks that we've seen and working out what they correspond to uh, and how you can uh, take the, use that to, f to find uh, an expression. So, for example, uh, let's look at a generic conformal block. Uh, we have solved this uh, by brute force in the previous section. Uh, first term is 1, the second term is a, a rather nice bit that comes straight from uh, the global conformal block, and then there's uh, this rather messier, we didn't even write it out fully, uh, term uh, using the inner product matrix, that should be an inverse there, uh, divided by the determinant, uh, where the determinant is a polynomial, and it was written down as a polynomial in terms of h, uh, but in fact you can see that, that you can also pull out a, a factor of c, c minus a value c star, uh, where that c star is 18h over 2h plus 1 minus 8h. Now there's a way to think about that. Uh, suppose that h was h12 of t. That implicitly defines t12 of h. And so we can define a c12 of h by, by evaluating c on that value. Uh, and what do we get? We get c star. So c star is uh, the value of c uh, for the value of t when h is equal to h12. And so we can write the determinant of n2 as two bits in h, 2h times 2h plus 1 uh, times a single factor, c minus is c12. Now, uh, the large c behavior of a conformal block is given by contributions from states which don't generate c in their commutation relations. Uh, those will kill them off in, in the numerator of their determinant. So it's only the uh, SL2, L minus 1 to the n uh, terms which contribute. So that leading C behavior as C goes to infinity is exactly the global conformal block, uh, So, which is uh, this hypergeometric function we've looked at before. And we saw that the first two terms in the conformal block uh, are given by that. And the question is, what happens if we subtract the global conformal block uh, from our expression. So we know what, <coughs> we just write down again, uh, what the, the total conformal block is. There's those two terms which match the global conformal block and then our rather unpleasant term. Sorry, I think I just left a z out. And the question is, what is the remainder? From that term, that z squared term, after taking off the factor from the global conformal block, which is given in terms of the Pockhammer symbols uh, by that rather simple expression. And the answer, if you work it out, is that it's remarkably simple. Uh, in fact, it factorizes. It's got two factors on the top, which it didn't have before. Uh, the, the numerator we know already is given by C minus C12 times and now 2h plus 1 all squared, because uh, we've got an extra factor. Uh, and the question is, what are those factors, which are remarkably simple? The first one just depends upon h1, 2, and h, and the second one just depends on h3, h4, and h. So it really is the two different parts of the, of the uh, conformal block the left bit and the right bit each have their own factor. And what they do is they ensure that the residue of the pole vanishes. Uh, so there's a pole term C minus C12, and if C equals C12, uh, and the model is well defined, and H1, H2, H3, and H4 appear in the model, then the coefficient should be zero. And so what those factors do is make sure that happens. The state space is reduced, the factor should be present, and it's the denominator that kills it off. So you can check uh, that factor vanishes, for example, in the case when uh, h is a half, h1 and h2 are both 1 16th, uh, and that's a uh, uh, c equals a half case. So the result. Uh, 
this global conformal factor uh, gets a corrections. Uh, it gets corrections uh, whenever c is equal to cmn, so that's the c of a t value, which is the t value if h is equal to hmn of c. And it gets multiplied by uh, another global conformal, uh, sorry, not another, another Virasoro block, actually evaluated at that value of c uh, for an intermediate channel that is the state uh, that has vanished or is decoupling and, ca and causing the pole. So this RMN factor has the factors that ensure the term vanish the residue vanishes, which have been calculated, and an overall H-dependent factor, which uh, actually was guessed by Zamologikov, uh, and it works. So an amazing guess, uh, which just works by looking at, at elementary examples and seeing how they behave. So you can give a closed form for expression for the recursion. Uh, as I said, it's a, it, so it is an exact expression for a conformal block, uh, packaging up the recursion uh, as a sum over certain partitions. Now there's a second recursion, uh, which is now repeated uh, in to know, uh, treating H the same way you did uh, C before. Uh, and you see the leading behavior of the conformal block uh, in large H. And from what we've done, you can, you can work it out and read it off. And it's E to the XH over 2. Uh, but that's only the very most leading behavior. It's actually much more complicated. So some logic off again works this out. And what you have to do is look at a uniformizing map that takes the three punctured sphere onto the plane, uh, which is in terms of a parameter Q given in terms of elliptic integrals K. And that is the leading behavior uh, in large H of the conformal block. Uh, there's a, there's a factor, that prefactor is missing in, in, in his papers because it, he chose not to put it in. I just left it out here by accident. So that the ingredients are theta function, uh, that should be n squared, not n, uh, q given in terms of elliptic functions. Uh, these have uh, several expressions uh, Well, I, I just put it here because uh, it's good to have the definition. So the recursion states that the conformal block, uh, again, up to that missing factor, is the exact answer times a function h, capital H, where capital H is 1 plus a sum over pole terms where the poles are now in h. And it turns out that the correct thing to do is now your, your um, monomial is now monomial in this factor 16q, which is like the new coordinate. Uh, you're no longer expanding it in powers of z, you're expanding it in powers of 16q, which you get after mapping from, from the uh, three punctured sphere to the plane. And the coefficient is a slightly changed r prime, so it has the same factors which remove the, this pole term whenever whenever it should be removed. Uh, slightly different multiplications, and then h evaluated at what the uh, pole term, uh, what the the uh, residue should be. These are very effective numerically. Uh, they're somewhat tricky to use to, when when the poles arise because the denomination and numerator can vanish to the same order, and so taking a, a limit, an analytic limit, will not really work very well. But numerically, if there are no, if, if you're away from a value where there's a pole, there's absolutely no problem. And these are certainly extremely good at large c or large h, because they give corrections uh, in 1 over c or 1 over h. And as I said, you, so, uh, you can package them up as exact expressions. Uh, so, so they were the first exact expression, but probably the, the exact the, the name for the exact formula is probably what pe people think of it is is the next term, 
the next is the subject of the next section, which is the AGT, AGT correspondence, which gives a series expansion, a, a somewhat more more ordinary series expansion for a conformal block, a general conformal block, in terms of uh, an instant on partition function for a supersymmetric gauge theory, uh, a very uh, uh, interesting and intriguing relation. So, in this section, section 8, we uh, finally come to the uh, famous AGT correspondence, uh, Alde, Gaiotto, Tachikawa, uh, which gives uh, exact expressions as series uh, for many things in conformal field theory, including uh, conformal blocks. And the idea is most strange when you think about it. It relates things in a conformal field theory, uh, Liouville theory, uh, to a supersymmetric gauge theory in four dimensions. Well, it, you can it, understand the idea. You wrap a, a six-dimensional theory on a Riemann surface and look at it in two ways, uh, either in four dimensions or two dimensions, and you get a dictionary uh, saying that this thing in four dimensions corresponds to this thing in two dimensions. Uh, so part of this is the requirement to do a pants decomposition of your Riemann surface. So your Liouville theory lives on a Riemann surface. Uh, so our, for, our, car, our conformal blocks correspond to correlation functions uh, with four points, and you put them on a sphere, with not, with never, not just the plane, but the sphere, and you can separate them into pairs of pants with fields at two ends. Uh, and a connection to a tube at the other one. You can do this in two ways. Well, you can do it in uh, three ways, but here are two of them. And this corresponds to uh, crossing symmetry. And each tube corresponds to a gauge theory. Each of those dots corresponds to some kind of matter. Uh, and so this is uh, an SU2 supersymmetric gauge theory uh, with four flavors. And you need to have uh, your conformal ingredients encoded in your gauge theory. So the conformal dimensions of the fields are encoded in the mass of the matter. Uh, the complex structure, which is here, the value of this cross-ratio z, is encoded in the gauge coupling. So from the gauge theory side, the calculation is uh, really quite involved because this is not a straightforward partition function. This is a Nekrasov partition function, which is why it can be calculated. Uh, it's on something called an omega deformed background. Uh, this would normally have uh, two parameters. Uh, they're related. There's a parameter B, uh, and that encodes the central charge. The central charge is encoded in the deformation of the background on which the gauge theory lives. So there's a parameter q, which is b plus 1 over b, and c is 1 plus 6 q squared, from which you can see if b is real, c is greater than or equal to 25. So this is a uh, case where there are no interesting uh, zeros of the uh, cast determinant. Uh, things are going to be uh, rather better behaved. And the partition function uh, is given as an integral over a classical uh, partition function, a uh, one-loop partition function, and an instant on sum. And the partition function uh, corresponds, uh, as I said, to uh, a four-point function. So you need to encode the uh, conformal dimensions. Uh, and in Liouville theory, uh, fields have momenta, they're called momenta. And, it's and the conformal dimension is related to the momentum uh, by that formula alpha into q minus alpha. And the momenta are allowed to live in a, a continuous range. So this is not a discrete model like a, a linear model, but the four-point function is an integral over an internal channel. Uh, there are structure constants uh, and a two-point function. And those are identified with the one loop. Uh, correction, the classical thing which is a prefactor, and the instant on sum is the thing that gives the conformal block. So the instant on sum is itself 
a complicated thing. It is a series expansion uh, summing over pairs of young tableau. Uh, the expansion parameter is the number of boxes and there is an expression for the coefficient in the expansion, z of y, y primed, uh, as a product, uh, a straightforward product made out of ingredients, uh, including uh, things over the boxes. There are uh, the pro two products over all the boxes uh, repeatedly. And the whole thing really is too complicated to show even the simplest result. Uh, I could show the paper, but I think just putting the reference in the in the in the list of in the list of references, you can go and look at the paper, and you can show it agrees order by order. Uh, it's not hard to write a program to do the sum. Uh, the, there were some online. I'm not sure if there still are, uh, and people have, I believe, proven this result. Uh, not by showing that uh, Liouville is gauge theory, but rather by showing that gauge theory is, is Liouville theory. Rather, the the, uh, the structure of the Virasoro algebra can be, uh, or at least the algebraic ingredients in the Virasoro algebra construction, uh, can have actions on the instant on space. I well, said so this dictionary allows calculation a series of very many things in the CFT. Uh, torus functions, uh, multiple correlation functions, always as series, uh, not as globally defined expressions. Uh, but nevertheless, if there's something you want to know a value of or want to know some properties of, then you will be able to find in this dictionary uh, a series expansion for the thing, and that may be very helpful. Uh, but principally, this is uh, an exact expression for the conformal block uh, as a series expansion, uh, which is, as far as anybody can tell, uh, completely correct. It doesn't place the other methods, uh, but I think it's just uh, astonishing where it comes from and the fact that, our, that this was the route by which it was found. Uh, so in the next section we'll go back to a, a rather more pedestrian way of constructing uh, conformal field theory using a detailed knowledge of the ingredients, uh, and that's the, the old style conformal bootstrap. Uh, and so now we finally come to uh, one of the uh, main achievements, which is uh, how to solve a CFT. And the ingredients we need are a set of fields, phi i, uh, and their scale dimensions, h and h bar, and their three-point couplings. And then everything else is going to be determined uh, by conformal invariance. Well, that's the plan. So how is this done? Well, uh, rather than describe it in abstract, I'll just go through an example using some of the ingredients that we've put together. And that's going to be an example at c equals a half. Uh, and we know what the allowed h values are uh, because we had a look uh, at the cat's table and the cat's table uh, has weights 0, 1 16th, and a half. And they are the only allowed values of h with unitary representations of the Virasoro algebra. Now, various field combinations are allowed. So we're going to be looking at a theory that's consistent on the plane. And there are uh, two sets of field content, which uh, are perfectly well-defined on the plane. And the first is what has four fields. These are the uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic dimensions, h and h bar. A field with dimensions 0 and 0 is the identity operator. One with half and 0 we often will just call psi, 0 half psi bar. And a half a half is the normal order product of psi with psi bar. And we we'll just call this a free fermion. This is a fermion as we've uh, come across many times before. And there's another one which is different. Uh, you notice the free fermion doesn't include the 16th field or any field with a 16th in it because that will introduce non-localities if you work it out. If you want a 16th 16th field then you can't have any fermions, you're only allowed a half a half. And this is called the easing model 
or uh, it's the spin model for the free fermion. And it's possible to show, uh, I mean, using null vectors, uh, like uh, many things, that there are only uh, allowed three-point couplings are the following. So uh, you look at a, a two-point function and then put a null vector in and see what happens, and you find that the, the sigma field can couple with itself to the identity, with itself to the epsilon field, or the epsilon field can only couple to the identity, not to itself or to sigma. And so, in fact, those are really not three-point couplings, they're two-point couplings. So there's just one unknown number, uh, C sigma sigma epsilon. And it's constrained. We can't choose it freely. Uh, it's constrained uh, through crossing symmetry and the properties of the conformal blocks. So let's start by writing down the four-point function of sigma with itself. So it couples the identity field, C sigma sigma 1 squared times in this case, we're going to look at the uh, chiral conformal block. So it's the absolute value squared of the conformal block going through the zero channel. And it also couples sigma sigma uh, potentially to the epsilon field. So there's an extra term, C sigma sigma epsilon. Uh, and that multiplies the other conformal block uh, squared, where it's the weight half in this immediate channel. So we've got exact expressions for these. Uh, we worked them out earlier. Uh, they're solutions of uh, second order differential equations. They're given in terms of hypodrectic functions. Uh, but they're also uh, very straightforwardly expressed in terms of what is a prefactor, uh, which takes account of the uh, 1 16th weight. That's why it has uh, 1 8 in there. And it's given by the square root of 1 plus 1 minus z. Sorry, one minus said, and the over two is to make sure the normalization that the leading term has a power of has a has a has a has a one as its coefficient, and the other one, well, you would think you just take one minus said and take the sign change the sign of the square root, but then that then has the wrong normalization, so you have to put an extra factor of two inside the square root, and so the constraint, uh, quite straightforwardly, uh, is that if you express the curl the, the conformal, uh, the four-point function in terms of the, the conformal blocks in one channel, uh, then it has to be equal to the expression in the other channel. And so here it is, just writing it out, just to be clear, in the cross channel, one minus z. So what we need is that these two functions, uh, two functional expressions are, uh, are the same. Well, the prefactor, that's fine. That's a function of z times 1 minus z. That's clearly not been changed when z goes to 1 minus z. Uh, but the things inside, well, because we're looking at the uh, absolute values of these conformal blocks, that square root has gone. It's become uh, an absolute value. And it looks a, a little odd. How can how can we've got a, a square root of 1 minus z in the first line and a square root of z in the second line. Uh, and faced with that the first time I saw it, I thought there's no way those are going to be equal. Uh, but it's a fact. Uh, you can try to prove this. I think it's on the exercises. Uh, it's extremely straightforward to, to convince yourself by doing a serial expansion. Uh, but these really do have the following relations, uh, which and so, uh, using those expressions, you can work out uh, exactly what the fusing matrices are. I think that's an exercise. Uh, but you don't need to, to write down the fusing matrices to work out what the constraint is. It is that C sigma sigma epsilon squared is a quarter. And it's conventional to choose it to be plus a half. So the theory is now fully determined. Uh, there's no freedom left. Uh, all you do have to do is to worry if it's consistent, and it is. So if you noticed, uh, this did not ever need a Lagrangian, uh, an action. It just used uh, symmetry, uh, unitarity, uh, and elementary properties of conformal field theory. 
And as a consequence, uh, it was called the conformal bootstrap. Uh, this is making reference to the S matrix bootstrap, uh, Jeffrey Chu's S matrix bootstrap from the 60s, which had tried to attempt to do the same thing uh, for the S matrix uh, with, before people came up with physically uh, relevant uh, Lagrangians. The idea was that maybe symmetry would just tie it down. And uh, there was a mistake. Uh, there was a square root missing off inside those square roots, so uh, here's the corrected formula. So that's a, just an example of uh, how the conformal bootstrap uh, works, how you can constrain all the structure constants uh, using crossing symmetry. Uh, that's not been achieved for all theories yet. Uh, it's been done for many. Uh, sometimes they're more complicated. Uh, Surprising what actually hasn't been done, has only been partially done. But uh, models such as the easing model, which are unitary minimal models uh, with cat's tables with c between 0 and 1, uh, they have been uh, fully understood in this way. So this last section is on. Uh, what you can call the new conformal bootstrap. Uh, new because it's from this millennium. And this uses purely global conformal invariance. So the previous conformal bootstrap used uh, full power of Virasoro symmetry. This uses uh, only the global SU11 plus SU11 or SL2 plus SL2 symmetry. And uh, just a reminder what the blocks look like. Uh, they are straightforwardly given in terms of hypergeometric functions for every value of H's. That's just uh, the Z dependent part. There's a corresponding Z bar dependent part. So the idea is to make an assumption. Uh, and if you've chosen a good assumption, you can get a contradiction, and that is the result you want. You have shown your assumption is wrong. So the better idea is to make the best possible wrong assumption you can and get as strong results as you can uh, by using uh, whatever technique you can to come up with uh, wrong assumptions and wrong methods to, and methods to prove that they're wrong. So this is a very simple example. Uh, from some lecture notes by uh, Rishkov. Uh, it's really simple-minded. Uh, it's much more complicated these days. You can't do it by hand. It's done by computers. But this is one where you can see how it works. And that's a, a good way to understand how the method works. So there's an assumption. And that assumption is that the theory has a scalar field. Uh, it's got a scale dimension d. And it's going to couple to a bunch of fields. It's going to couple in particular to the identity. But then after that, it's going to couple to other fields. Uh, but we're going to make an assumption that they all have much larger scale dimension. So the scale dimension of the fields that couple to is delta is going to be much bigger than d. Uh, and as we'll see, uh, that can't happen. Uh, if you've got a, a field of dimension d, it has to couple to fields whose dimension is not too far away. This is a quite a strong result. It doesn't. It's not. It is valid for all values of c. So what we're going to use is we're going to use uh, crossing symmetry, and uh, also going to use unitarity. Uh, we'll take that for granted. And so what we do is write the four-point function in its standard form. So there's the 1 over z to the 2d, which is the global uh, block coupling to the identity field, and then a coupling lambda o squared, uh, and there's a global block where we've got z and z bar dependence uh, to the field whose scale dimension is delta. And we'll take z real. That's where we've got 1 over z and not 1 over mod z. And it has an expansion uh, in the cross-channel as well where now we replace z by 1 minus z. And the idea is to treat these equally, or fairly equally, and so we'll expand 
uh, around z equals a half. So z is a half plus epsilon, and z bar is a half minus epsilon. So let's take uh, the first term, z to the 2d. Just expand that around a half, a half plus epsilon to the 2d. Well, that's easier, just a straightforward Taylor expansion. But the difference is z to the 2d minus 1 minus z to the 2d. Well, all the even powers of epsilon are going to cancel. And so the first leading power is epsilon. And then there's an epsilon cubed term. And the constant out the front is, as you can see, positive. We'll call it cd to uh, make it easier later on. Now, this difference is going to be equal to a sum over operators. Looking back to where it was before, it's a sum over uh, lambda O squared, the coupling to the operator O squared, times the difference of those two contributions from the two global blocks. Now, you can see that there's a, that there's a z to the 2d multiplying a block at 1 minus z, and a 1 minus z to the 2d multiplying a block at z. And the point is, if delta is much bigger than d, the z to the 2d really doesn't win. It's the, it's, the, it's the global block that has dominates, and that's why it turns out that it looks like 4 thirds delta squared epsilon cubed, and the d, we've dropped that because d is much less than delta, and so its term is unimportant. And so now we can compare uh, these two sides, order by order in epsilon. There's a, an order epsilon term, and an order epsilon cubed term. And what we can do is we can use these uh, to get an inequality for delta min squared, the minimum value of delta that uh, couples to the operator phi. And we can multiply top and bottom uh, by the sum of lambda O squared AO. But now on the top, we can say that delta min squared is less than delta squared, and the bottom stays the same. And now the top is the left-hand side of our epsilon cubed relation, and the bottom is the left-hand side of our order epsilon relation. CD cancels, and what we've found is that the minimum dimension has to be less than the square root of d minus 1, 2d minus 1, and that clearly can't be true if delta min is much, much bigger than d. So that's the contradiction. Now, it can actually be rephrased in, in, in a way that, that it generalizes. Much, it's easy to see how to do it. And you can write it as the sum of lambda squared times something which your assumption says is positive plus another positive term. And so since we've now got a sum of lambda squared times positive terms plus positive terms is zero, we find there's no solution. So lambda squared positive we have come up with a contradiction uh, from a linear relation. And the idea is to find uh, sets of linear relations which have no solution. Uh, so uh, currently people are looking at new ways to obtain these from uh, crossing relations in, in clever ways in order to uh, maximize the information you can get out. So this is... <coughs> This is an extremely useful and powerful numerical technique. Uh, here there was a small assumption about uh, we could ignore the order d terms. Of course, you can do it properly. You can get an exact relation and you can... But really, the power of this is numerically. So that's one of the mo more recent topics, and there are quite a few that, uh, of course, I have no time to mention. Uh, and the most glaring one is not talking about relation to ADS-CFT. But uh, conformal blocks also have other applications. Uh, they've been used in the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Uh, there are very important integral representations that uh, I've had no chance to talk about. Uh, people look at light, heavy blocks and get uh, relations from uh, AGT. Uh, <clears throat> there are many things which you'd have thought might have uh, been finished, that somehow this topic would have been uh, long gone, uh, given how elementary it is. Uh, but it seems that there's ever more information to be got out of these, and they're still being looked at. Uh, 
And that's the end of this lecture. Uh, there's a bunch of exercises and some uh, references, uh, and there'll be a live lecture next week. So, thank you very much for making it to the end. Uh, I hope you found it, uh, if not entertaining, at least informative. Uh, again, if you have any questions, especially if you find mistakes, the more embarrassing the better, uh, please get in touch. Uh, and thank you for your attention.